Um, so have you ever in your life been confused? Anybody ever been there? Been confused? Is anybody confused right now? Um, has anybody been confused? Have you ever misread or misunderstood a situation and have it go terribly wrong? A lack of understanding of a situation can be disastrous. There have been so many battles lost by commanders who were confused about their enemy, the terrain, or even their own trip uh, troops. Um, there have been men who were confused. They got in serious trouble with their spouses as a result of the confusion. There have been kids who've gotten bad grades in class as a result of their confusion. But when I think about being confused when it regards to military, um, nobody, I think, was more confused on a certain day than uh, Colonel George Custer on June 1876. Many of you, no doubt, learned about General Custer and what was called his last stand, and it shouldn't be called his last stand because he did not stand a chance. Now, if you don't know, let me clue you in a little bit. General Custer with 210 men, and so you know, he had more men at his disposal, but he made a mistake of splitting them up. But 210 men faced thousands and thousands of Sioux and Cheyenne warriors on 1876 in June. And they died to the last man. Now, what was going on during this time was the Indians um, who um, were trying to maintain their way of life. They were trying to maintain um, what they knew for, for years, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the government had signed this treaty with the Indians and said, listen, you guys can be up here in Montana, we'll leave you alone, and this will be great. But then somebody found gold up there. And so the government backtracked and they assigned Custer with rounding up the Indians and getting them to go on the reservation and killing any that didn't. And so this was his job, and in this job, he went out and he found a big, huge group of encampment of Indians, women and children, thousands of them. And so he decided the strategy was is that he was going to go on a mountaintop, a, a hill. He was going to send his two other brigades of troops down to attack on the bottom, and he was going to attack from the top. And so he did that. Um, his his, his uh, troops went down the bottom and he stayed on top. And as they attacked, the other troops that attacked from the bottom, the other regiments fled, realizing that this was crazy. Like, when you were a kid, did you ever kick over a fire ant hill? Come on now. I did. Um, I, do you guys have fire ants here? Okay. They're in Louisiana. I lived there for two years, and they bite like crazy. And if you ever kick like a, a, a regular anthill, they'd be like, hey, what'd you do? Stop it. If you kick over a fire anthill, they'd be like, it's on, son. Everybody attack. And there are like millions of ants down there. There's a video online where a guy tries to blow up an anthill and ended up blowing up in his whole backyard because he didn't realize how vast it was. And so they realized that, that there was the Indians had gathered. In fact, Tons of Indians had gathered in this place trying to keep their way of life. It had gotten so bad that military couldn't root them out, so they decided they were going to have railroad people stop and kill their buffalo so they wouldn't have anything to eat. That's how bad it got. So these are some mad, angry, upset, rightfully so people that are justified in their anger and really ready to do something. And that hornet nest is what Custer walked into. Now, Custer, you may or not know this, he uh, finished last, 34th in a class of 34, and West Point finished at last. But when he went into his military career, Custer um, fought in the Battle of Gettysburg. He, he fought in, in some other battles and did well. Custer was shot off his horse 11 times. Like, the horse was shot out from under him. He got up and fought. He wasn't afraid to fight. He never knew how to back down. He was only wounded once. So this is the guy that everybody thinks is a hero. This is the guy everybody thinks is going to take care of this Indian problem. And this guy was confused. So he sent his regiment down, and they all fled, and he was on the hilltop, and he thought he was spied, so it was too late. The, the rabbit was out of the hat. He had to attack, and so he did. 
And he cost his own, his own life and everyone around him's life because he thought he knew better. He was confused about the terrain. He was confused about the enemy he was fighting. He was confused about what his troops could do. In fact, when they started attacking, many of his own troops fled and were killed while they were fled. They didn't understand what was going on. Now, that battle is called the Battle of, Li uh, of Little Horn, maybe if you want to look it up. Sometimes, I think, though, when we find ourselves confused, we find ourselves defeated. Have you ever been there? When you don't know what's going on, or you don't know the direction, or you don't know how to get to some place, you will find yourself lost. On the way to Botanical Gardens with my older brother and his uh, new wife, me and, and my uh, uh, wife, who was, I was dating at the time, went to St. Louis to Botanical Gardens with him. And someone had given him a map. Now, back then, kids, no cell phones except car phones. And, or, and Zach Morris had one. Say by the bell. 90s. Look it up. Um, big, huge phone. They were this big. So no one really had cell phones. So they, back then, when you had to get direction, people would give you a map. So if you were like, Say, how do you get to Elmer Wolf Elementary from my house, past Charlie Leffridge's farm? You know, you'll see some cows. You will smell something. You're almost there. Um, so this, someone had written my brother a map, and they forgot a step in it. And so we're driving downtown St. Louis. You know, you don't do that. <laughs> if you've ever been there, I feel safer in Baltimore. Um, and we're lost. My brother is getting upset. Him and, him and his wife are getting into it. And his wife, bless her heart, when she's upset and doesn't know what to do, she laughs. And so that made my brother more mad. And at one point, he's like, I don't know, he's 20-some years old. He reached over and grabbed her map. She's like, I'm just following the map. <laughs> and he grabs her like, this is why I think of your map. Rah! And throws it out there. And Michelle and I are just like dying laughing back here like, this is good, man. We got there, but we had to stop and ask for directions because without the right steps, you get confused and you get lost. Someone could have told Custer, hey man, you have 210 people. In fact, they thought that the Indians were going to be shooting at them with bows and arrows. But in fact, the Indians had been supplied with rifles and were very efficient and very good at, better than his own cavalry, was shooting them from horseback. They would have said, Custer, look, this isn't going to work out for you. Now, I don't know what you're confused about, but if you haven't done the time to study, the time to pray, the time to look at the situation, what's going to happen is if someone could stop time and say, look, Jade, whoever you are, you need to listen and you need to understand something. You need to get learned. Let me teach you something because you don't know what you're doing. I remember one time I was putting a, a deck together. I was building my kids a playhouse, you know. So I got some nails and I got some treated lumber and I hammered them out on one side and stood on the other and the nails came right out. You laugh because you know, Dan. I didn't know, Dan. It's not my fault, Dan. And so I was like, okay, whatever, bam, 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 again, come over here, bam, 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 and flip the thing over, it all falls apart. Right then, my retired pastor comes out, well, well, well. He's my neighbor. His name was Jim. Pastor Jade, what are you doing there? I'm building a deck, Pastor Jim. Are you? I noticed uh, your nails are slipping out of your board. Yes, they are. Why is that, Pastor Jade? I don't know. I'm confused. Did you have to use decking nails? What is that? Well, it keeps it from slipping out. <laughs> and so I went to the store and I got decking nails. But if I said, don't, don't tell me what to do, Pastor Jim. I know what I'm doing. There would have been nothing built. And some of you guys are confused in your life. You don't know how to, how to deal with social situations or you don't know how to deal with your marriage or you don't know how to deal with your kids. You don't know how to read your Bible. You don't know what this church thing is all about. Whatever it is that you're confused about and God wants to help you. In fact, He wrote a whole word. He wrote the Bible to help you and instruct you and many of us don't even crack it open. And so we stay in this, this, this uh, life of confusion and what happens is it's Satan sinks us because he has fooled us. We don't get any better because we don't get instruction. Satan keeps us confused and he wants you confused about who God is, what God can do. 
He wants you to stay confused in that. And so, so many of you guys think that your life is tied up in your kid's sports. And because you're good, your, your kid is good at sports, man, life is great. But then your kid graduates and you're left at home with your husband or your wife and you don't know what to do now. And you find out life isn't about that at all. And some of you think if your kids get good grades, then they're good kids. And, and they're going to be great in life. And they get good grades and they take a turn for the worse. And you're confused about what's going on. And some of you think, if I just get that great job that I love. If I can just get out from this job that pays well. But I get that great job that I love, that life's going to be great. And you're confused. Because life is not about, please hear me. Life is not about the job that you do. Life is not about money. Life is about God. Amen. Life is about God. Amen. You are not living your story. You're living God's story. And He's telling it. You're not the star of it. You're part of it. Amen. And aren't you glad the focus is not on you? Have you ever, you ever seen a battle like in Star Wars or something like that? I remember as a kid watching Luke Skywalker fighting Darth Vader thinking that would be horrible to fight your own dad with some kind of weird light sword. And I, I remember being kind of afraid for him because, you know, he could force choke you. But he was brave. But I wouldn't want to be that. If I could choose to be one of those, I want to be like that little, what's that, those, the robot called? <laughs> yeah, man! He just kind of every once in a while zaps someone to the side. That's what I want, right? I don't want to be the person that has to do the great thing. And you and I think that we are the person that has to do the great thing. I got to be, I got to be the best at this. I got to be the best at that. And when we're not, we're frustrated. And the reality is, God is the one who wins the victory. Amen. God is the one who conquers sin and death, not me and you. God is the one that will overcome your addiction. God is the one that will fix your marriage. God is the one that will save your kids. You only need to be faithful. It wasn't Israel that, part, that, that parted the Red Sea. It was who? God. It wasn't Abraham that provided the child. It was who? Wake up. It was who? God. God. It wasn't David that slayed the giant. It was who? God. God is the one that handles the situation. And our God can do anything. But we're confused. We can think there's nothing that God can do. And Peter was confused. Out on the boat, in our chapter, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. He was in the boat with the disciples and Jesus walks by on the water. It's amazing. He walked on the water, okay? Now, there's some Bible scholars that try to explain this away, that the water was shallow, and he just happened to be walking in shallow water, or they had been blown all the way to the side, and Jesus happened to be walking on the shoreline. No, Jesus, it's real clear. Jesus was literally walking on water, defying gravity, defining how water works, okay? When I was a kid, I convinced my older brother, that he could, my little brother, that he could walk on water. He didn't. Okay, I told him if he had enough faith, he just went right in. Water will drown you, water will quench your thirst, water will sink you if you go in it. Okay, if you don't know how to swim, it will sink you. So Peter sees Jesus doing this, he's like, I want some of that. God, if that's you, call me out. And so Peter, Jesus says to Peter, and listen, Jesus said, come. Peter asked, but Jesus said, come. And Peter stepped down the water, and what happened? The enemy came. Who's the enemy? Do you remember from last week who the enemy is? The wind. That's right. The wind and the waves. He gets us scared, and he starts to sink, and P Jesus walks up to Peter real gently and kind, and says, man, why'd you doubt? I got you. And then Peter, at that point, is not in the boat. So Peter now, with Jesus, is walking on water again. Did you know that? Jesus rescued him. He walks on water. And then the wind's still going, man. And Jesus steps into the boat and the wind stops. It dies down. Matthew 14, 22 through 23. I don't remember if I have it here. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat washed him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So, here's the word. Confusion about what God can do will limit what God will do in our life. We need to take the won't out of His will. You can write this down if you want to. Confusion about what God can do will limit what God will do in our lives. When we put limits on God in our mind and our heart, 
God then is limited. In fact, in Scripture, Jesus enters a town and He doesn't do any miracles because the people don't have any faith. There's not enough faith that is there. And you and I at times get confused about what our God can do, and so we limit what He will do. Jesus called Peter. He said, come. Peter asked, but Jesus encouraged. Peter's confusion was not in the presence of the enemy. The wind was there. The waves were there. It was powerful. But in the power of his ally, the wind was there. Peter wasn't wrong about those things. The thing is, though, God makes the laws of nature. He is not hindered or limited to them. You're talking about a God who speaks things into existence. Amen? You're talking about a God who can change the dynamic of water and gravity to the point where He can't sink. You see, Jesus is the storm's master. We're at Halloween time, right? Where people start getting scared. And if you don't know anything about Halloween, Halloween kind of started because people, um, at this time, the, the, the light would get kind of you know, as, you know, it gets darker sooner, and people start getting afraid, and they didn't have things like, you know, um, heat, forced air, you know, and things like that. And so people died and starved in the winter if they didn't have what they needed to do. And so it was kind of a scary kind of time of year. And so people started being afraid at this time of year, and they attempted as best they could to try to make something out of it, okay? And so this time of year, people are, are unrightfully scared, wrongfully scared of things. And um, so, you know, at this time of year, you'll see on TVs like, you know, Friday the 13th and all these other scary things. Because for whatever reason, people like to be scared, you crazy people. You nuts people. But Jesus is the thing that the big bad wolf and the boogeyman are afraid of. Did you know that? Jesus is the thing that the big bad wolf and the boogeyman are afraid of. When I was in Tennessee being a youth pastor, I got a call from a, a you know, teenager. And he called me up. And he was camping out on the campground behind us. And he was very scared. And he was uh, there was a, a graveyard near the campground, on the campground actually, close to my house. Old, very old graveyard. He was afraid about it. And he started talking to me about some different things. And so I brought him up to my house. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. Okay, um, He's lucky I let him live. No, um... He came to my house, and he was very afraid. He had a friend with him, and he was telling me all this stuff that he had seen. And, and it was clearly that he was afraid of some demonic forces. And I said, well, you're okay now. He said, why? I said, you're in my house, and Satan ain't allowed in my house. He said, what do you mean? I said, I am a person who believes in Jesus Christ. I carry within me the living God, and he can't be around me. Not because of me, because of that. So you can sleep soundly tonight. Because he's not going to get in this house. Who you're afraid of, you shouldn't be afraid of anyway. But who you're afraid of, he's not going to get in this house. He was confused. And some of you live your lives in fear because of your fusion. Of not knowing what's going on. Sometimes my kids will wake up in the middle of the night and, they, and they'll scream and they're afraid. And I always say to them, listen, daddy in here is much more dangerous than what's going on on there. If a guy comes in here, I'm going to take care of it. If someone comes here, I'm going to take care of it. You misunderstand here, thinking that you're vulnerable here because your daddy's here. And some of you, and that's me being cocky, I know, but some of you are misunderstanding and are afraid because your daddy is here. Amen? Not me. God. He's in your life and Satan has plans and Satan has designs and he fools you so he sinks you. He fools you so he sinks you. And your faith falters and you start to sink because you're confused that you serve a God that can do all things. Amen? There is nothing that God can't do and will do in your life, but it requires faith. It requires belief. It requires trust. Yes, Jesus is the thing that the boogeyman is afraid of. By the way, there's no boogie thing and there's no such thing as a ghost, just, just so you know. If you say there is, you're wrong. <laughs> okay? Jesus is the master of the storm. Problems run from Him and therefore we run to Him. Our Savior is always bigger than what's the matter. Peter had stepped out on faith and was walking on water, but confusion set in and you turned Him. As a result, He went from sinking from walking to sinking. 
Have you ever went from walking to sinking in your life, from victory to defeat, from spiritual waking to spiritual numbness? I baptized this lady one time that had been addicted to drugs and she had been sober and, and we got a horse trough up on the stage. And same, kind of, same kind of baptism we have now. And I dunked her in the water and she told me later on that the moment she got out of that water, she felt like she was being attacked. She started hearing thoughts in her head that she was no good. That there was no way that God could save her. And so she relapsed. And I got a phone call from her family that she had fell, or that she had seized and split her lip all the way to her nose. Her teeth were exposed. And I went into her house, which wasn't clean. And when I mean that, if I say that, like vacuum hadn't seen this place. Smell was in the air. When you don't take care of your stuff, when that happens, and I'm not insulting the person that does that, but when you don't take care of your stuff, there's not a lot of pride there. And so I walked into a room where there's a lot of hopelessness in there. She had lost her nine-year-old mother that year. And I sat there, and, and she was a, a pretty girl. And she had lost the thing that she had. Her lips split open. I said, when you took those pills, you heard a voice in your head, didn't you? That I'm no good. So what does it matter and why should I fight it? She said, that's exactly what I heard. And you've thought you're no good your whole life, haven't you? She goes, yeah. I said, but God made you good. God doesn't make mistakes. You are an accident. God made you good, but Satan took what God had made good and twisted it. He's been doing it from time, and God loves you. I looked at this person and I said, did you know that God loves you absolutely just as much as he loves me? In fact, this moment, right now, he might be loving you a little more. There's no way. That's not true. I said, it is absolutely true. And that's the lie that Satan has been confusing you about your whole life. God sees you as beautiful. He doesn't care that your lip is split. He doesn't care that you've gone back in the same hole that he took you out of. He's going to rescue you time and time again. Do you realize and understand that he doesn't make mistakes, that he loves you just the way you are? Listen, this isn't the only time Peter failed. Peter didn't want Levi, Matthew, to even be a disciple because he was a tax collector. Peter, when Jesus was taken, didn't want to go to the cross with Jesus, so he drew a sword. And when Jesus said to Peter, this isn't the way, he denied Christ three times. Three times. Even after Jesus was resurrected and he restored him, he wouldn't even eat with the Gentiles until Paul got on to him. Peter was a screw up. Oh, but Peter was a person that spread the church of God. Listen, you made mistakes today, some of you. You're going to make more. But don't get confused. God is bigger than your mistake. Amen. God can transform everything about you and in you and through you if you stop allowing Satan to to fool you and make you think that you're no good and make you think that there's no way that God can save of us. Save me. So here's a skinny. Confusion about the word depowers the word in our life. So what I mean by is the words that God has spoken to you, if you're confused about them, it depowers them. So when something happens in my life, I make a mistake God's word calls me to correct it. When I feel no good, God's word calls me to realize that I am good. When I feel like we're treating within myself, God calls me to say, no, you are called out to witness. God's word, which I have placed in my life, placed inside me since I gave my life to Jesus Christ, that I do every day, that I've placed that word inside me, is lived out through me when I'm pressed. But if you don't know God's word, you are going to be depressed. Because you're not going to know the hope that God has inside you. The hope that God has for every one of you. And here's the problem. Christians being uneducated about what God's word says has screwed up God, the world's view of who God is. Amen? Meaning Christians being confused about God's word has messed up God's word in the world's life. That's why they think that we hate homosexuality. I mean, homosexual people. We do not. We do not hate homosexual 
people. We do not hate anybody. It makes us think that we hate certain races, and that's not true. We believe everybody was created by God, that every race is beautiful, but the world thinks that because we're uneducated. And the world thinks that it come in this door that you have to be perfect because we're not uneducated about the Word of God. Listen, there are people in here right now that believe they're Christians and they're not living a Christian life and it's not our job to point it out, it's our job to love them through it. We don't need to make comments on Facebook or anywhere else about what we think is wrong. We need to talk about what we think is right. The God that we love. The God that we serve. We need to stop being confused about the fact that it's our job to point out people's sin. It's our job to love them through the sin. Amen? We need to stop allowing confusion to you turn our faith so that our faith can progress. So the kingdom of God can be here right now today. But if you don't have God's word, you can't live out the kingdom of God. You don't know which way to go. Listen, it's not a list of rights and wrongs. It's a list of how to live our lives. And specifically, what to live our lives for. Now you may be saying, yeah, Jade's talking to so-and-so, they're a liar. Or Jade's talking, talking to so-and-so, they're an addict. Or Jade, listen to me, guys. You will find liars and addicts and adulterers and murderers and people in the Bible that have done what they shouldn't do and you'll find the grace of God has saved them from it. The grace of God removed that from their lives and the grace of God transformed their lives. And some of us, because we point out what we think is wrong, when someone curses too much or someone lies or someone doesn't do what we think they should do, we start judging them and by judging them, we stop what God, God is doing in them and they shut themselves off from God completely. What we need to do is hug and love and care for them. And when I say hug, you don't have to physically hug them, but spiritually embrace them. Because if we're going to reach the world, we're going to have to get our hands dirty, aren't we? We're going to have to be uncomfortable, aren't we? In places that Christians don't usually go. Now, did Jesus hang out in the synagogue all the time? Where do you think? Don't answer. Just in your head. If Jesus was here right now, where do you think he'd be going and getting his disciples from? I know he wouldn't come get me. I guarantee he'd be at a bar. I guarantee he'd be out on a square. I guarantee he'd be where those people are that are lost. It doesn't mean he wouldn't come here. It doesn't mean he wouldn't worship. You do find Jesus in the synagogue. But where you see miracles take place is where the people are. Wherever they're broken, wherever they're hurting, wherever they're a sinner, wherever they need healing, you find Jesus there. Don't be confused by my words. He said, bar. Understand God's word. The Bible says that he wants none to perish. None to perish. None to perish. And you and I, at times, act like we want everyone to perish but us. That nobody's good enough but us. And let me tell you, you are confused. Because you have sins that I don't know about, and no one knows about, but you do. And if you don't have any, then you've got the sin of judgment. Christ and Christ alone is the judge. Sin is seeking us. The infusion about the word depowers it in our lives. Jesus called Peter. That was all the empowering that he needed. If God calls you to it, God will get you through it. If God calls you to it, God will get you through it. So, listen, God doesn't move on our timetable. So if someone has a little bit of a vulgar inner language, God doesn't move on their timetable. He may be moving something else. In their life. Do you understand? And they have to just take time. If someone's addicted to smoking cigarettes again, I don't think that's going to lead you to hell, okay? But God's going to move that in His time, not your time. And you've got to trust God's time. The movement of God is supposed to be carried in us. So if God's movement is love, when people interact with us, there should be love there. And listen to me. It starts at home. 
Maybe some of you have a family member and you're confused because they hurt you. You think it's okay to not talk to them. You're confused. Because the Word of God says He doesn't want anybody to perish. And some of you have that co-worker that said the wrong thing, and so you feel like gossiping about their hind, behind their back all the time. Let me tell you something. You're confused. The Bible says that we are supposed to be all things to all people, meaning that the whole job and the whole goal is to know God and to get people to God. Know God, get people to God. So I don't got time to hold a grudge. I don't have time to make an enemy. I don't have time to be upset. I've got time for God's Word and get people to it. Amen? I've got time for God's Word and to get people to it. Some of you maybe aren't looking up at me this morning, and you should. Because your lives need to change. My lives need to change. So, here's a takeaway. Lift the fog by turning the page See, Satan wants us to fight our fellow man so we won't fight him. Satan wants us to fight our fellow man so we won't fight him. So when I was in, in my brother was in Little League, I, I was never very, very good at baseball. Um, was anybody ever else afraid of the, the baseball when you played baseball, a little scared of it, you know? And so I never swing when I played Little League. I'd just be like... But in, if you ever play Little League baseball, nobody can pitch except Levi White. Um... He can. I've seen it. It's the only one um, that I've seen that age. So you just stand there. You're going to get on base. Well, I played it one year. I didn't like it. Dad's like, that's fine, Jade. You know, go play. So I played it one year. The next year I was on my own, and my brother was playing Little League. We had four teams in the whole league, and we just played each other all summer long. And so I would get in trouble, and I remember I picked a fight with this bigger kid, and, and he started choking me, like literally Hands around my throat, choking me. And I punched him a couple times, did nothing, and he's choking me. My older brother now and I are like really good friends. But when we were growing up, like I said, he may ever heard their kids, their younger kids say, I hate you! Anybody ever heard their kids like that? I don't ever talk to you again! You know, those are the things I said to my older brother. And he responded like, <laughs> you know, pound me. So this, this guy was choking me, right? He's choking me. And as I'm about to black out, I see... This older brother come to my defense, take care of the situation. Now, if you'd asked me before that moment, do you like your older brother? At that point, when I was young, I would have said, no. I hate him, you know. He always picks on me. He always teases me. But that day, that was laid aside. And the real enemy, what was going on, was no one's going to mess with my little brother. I'm going to take care of it. And often, we pick fights with people we shouldn't be fighting. We should be fighting for. Because this is the thing. We fight for our rights. We don't ever fight for other people. It's the same reason we struggle to get people in small groups for children. It's because people are only worried about their own children. Once their own children's out, who cares about the other kids? But then there's sacrificial people like Janet that says, you know what, it doesn't matter. I care about all kids. I want all kids to come to knowledge of their Lord and Savior. And when you and I let down the fight with another, other people, or what other people, we pick up the fight against Satan. And what happens is, is Satan is defeated in people's lives. Because we stop fighting them. You're confused today if you think that God allows us to hold grudges to our fellow man. You are confused today when that waitress like, takes too long that you can be snooty to her. You are confused. And you need to be educated. So we have this idea of what's right and what's wrong, right? And this is my thing. This is truth about me. Election season's coming up, man. Okay. I'm not going to endorse a candidate. Actually, here to announce I'm running for... No. Um... But when somebody thinks a certain thing I, that I disagree with, I don't think they're evil or that they're trying to, to kill the country. I think they're confused. And if when somebody says something to you that's upset at you for some reason, if you just stop looking at it and say, you know, they're confused, I'm going to help them. When that, when that waitress is, is not doing what they need to do, maybe you think they're not getting that drink fast enough, maybe you could help them. And encourage them. We took a big group to Steak and Shake. Do we have Steak and Shakes around here? 
It's a little steak, a little shake, you know what I'm saying, all right? And um, a little shake, milkshake, people. And um, so they make these milkshakes. They're big, okay? My, I used to, when I was a kid, I went to a milkshake place that they would give you the milkshake and they'd give you the thing that they made the milkshake in. So you got a milkshake and then like another milkshake, okay? So they're steak burgers. So they take ground sirloin, put them in a patty, and smash them down. Oh, just, do you guys want some burgers? On this flat top, man. They put some onions on it. Oh, it's good. And then the best combination ever is a burger and shake. I'm sorry. If you think something different, you're wrong. Okay? I know Old Bay and, and Crabs is awesome, but burger and shake's better. Sorry. Sorry. And um, so we're there. The kids are excited. And this waitress is not getting her meal. And I've got like 30 kids on this mission trip. Uh, we were down in somewhere. And, and they, we weren't getting served. And so I had, this, uh, I had this teen whose name was Dan Parchman. He talked like this. Hi, Pastor Jane. <laughs> yeah, Dan, what's up? I got a tinkle. You got a tinkle? Yeah, I got a tinkle full of bus over Pastor Jay. That's how he talked, you know. And so he just had this southern charm about him. He's just talking like this. And he said, well, how you doing, lady? Doing good. Yeah, well, it's okay. And she goes, I'm sorry I haven't got your drinks. And it's been a long time. He goes, are you okay today? Everything all right? I mean, this is, this is Dan. Dan, like sometimes, one time literally eating a steak and shake, I was sitting down eating and I saw the cops out talking to Dan. This is Dan. And he started talking to this lady. And she had the worst day ever. And we changed that. Do you know what I mean? Because Dan, who was confused about a lot of things, about when to tinkle, wasn't confused that day about what mattered. And what if today you weren't confused about that either? What if you didn't get on Facebook and care what people thought or liked? What if you didn't worry about what was on TV because it's not important? What if you don't get too upset because your team didn't win? What if you don't worry about what that person said at work? What if you realized that you weren't even trying to make money? That God sent you in the job that you're in to be a missionary where you're at? What if you go into that uh, grocery store today because you forgot to get groceries like me? And you think that maybe your job is to go in there and smile and be the love of Christ. And maybe you have a family member. To them, you are the enemy. But you're confused. Your job is to love them through it. Don't allow confusion to you turn your purpose and your faith. Heavenly Father, I know. Man, I struggle with this at times because I want to be upset. There's times I want to be upset. There's times I want to be mad. And there's times I fail at it. And Father, we're confused about the fact that if we think that, that we're a Christian and we're going to be perfect. But Father, I believe more than anything that we're confused about why we're here. We're here to know you and bring you to everybody we know. Because Father, this isn't our story. This is your story that's being told. And praise God, I get to be a part of it. They get to be a part of it. Father, we, we are a fallen people in a fallen world. We do not have time to be upset with one another. It, time is too short. And there's people here right now They've got a struggle. They've got a grudge. They've got something holding them back. And they, they, they can't let it go because they haven't given up. And Father, if they crack open that Word and they'd read that Word, they'd find that we're not called to point out people's sin. We're called to bring Your love. That we're more often called to love than rebuke. Father, You say in Your, your Word that if anybody that was a believer falls away, that we're to gently restore them. And Father, we're confused that our neighbor is there to serve us. And we're confused about this church is here to serve us. And Father, we are called to serve you. Everybody here is called to serve you, to be a believer, to be your disciple. And there are people out there, Father, who do not know you. And we're too worried about our journey and our story and what we're upset about. Father, if we can get onto your heartbeat, we can get back on track and head to the path of purpose that you've designed for us. Father Custer, man, he was all confused and it cost him his life. What's it going to cost us? What's it going to cost me? What's it going to cost them if they allow that confusion to overtake them? What's it going to take for us to open your word and read it and live it and be it? We ask this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Everybody said,